my donations should go to glaucoma research. I feel so strongly about this because it came as such, such a shock to me when I was diagnosed. And I was hoping that there might be better ways in the future for people to be diagnosed and treated. So um, today we are, have two glaucoma researchers from the UC Davis Eye Center who will share their amazing, amazing progress in the diagnosis and treatment of glaucoma. And we're very, very pleased to have them. So please welcome our very special guests who will tell you about themselves and about their work. Nick Marsh Armstrong, I'm a professor at UC Davis Ophthalmology. And um, I've been in Davis for four years. I was a uh, faculty at Johns Hopkins University and it was uh, a very generous donor who actually made it possible for me to relocate my laboratory uh, to UC Davis where we continue to study glaucoma. I actually, it's, it's kind of surprising, both Anna and I are, are born in Spain. You wouldn't guess that from, from me or my last name. Um, she can tell you about herself. I've been most of my life here in the States, um, mainly in the East Coast, and only moved to California four years ago. I trained in the East Coast at a small, I like to call a country club called Haverford College, as where I did my college. And then uh, I did my graduate work at, at Harvard up in Boston. And then, as I said, I came down to Hopkins and Baltimore, and then only recently here. But I should say, I've been studying retina eye for decades now. <laughs> And I've been very interested in understanding what goes wrong in, in glaucoma. And I'm just going to pass it on to Anna, and then I'll get into the science. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Anna La Torre. And as you can guess by last name and by a little bit of accent, uh, I'm from Spain. Um, so I was uh, recruited to UC Davis five years ago after I did my postdoc uh, at the University of Washington in Seattle. And um, my research program is a little different than Nick's. He's a true glaucoma researcher. I'm a developmental biologist. What it means is that I study stem cells and how we can use these stem cells to develop therapies. Um, so I'll tell you uh, more about that. Um, so Nick, Nick, if you want to. Okay. Um, so, um, so what I'm gonna do today um, is um, I'm going to tell you a little bit of the science that we do uh, in my lab. I'm going to intermix it in, with, but this is really a, a class in glaucoma and as, based, as viewed from a, not your clinician um, uh, who has their own perspective in, in treating you, but this is as a basic scientist. I'm going to you know, tell you what we as basic scientists think about um, this disease and what needs to be done to understand and cure it. So um, you should all be taking notes and there'll be a quiz at the end. That's, that, that's a joke, there, there is no quiz here. Um, so, uh, so as you know, probably many of you may have glaucoma or know people who do. I, when I started studying this, didn't have any personal connection. Now I have two family members who are affected um, and which puts me in a pretty good risk to get the disease myself. Um, but that's not why I study it. And, um, you know, I study it because it affects millions and millions of people, as you know, and it's, um, you know, it's a thief of vision uh, that affects, you know, over 60 million people. And what probably most of you know about it is that it has something to do with intraocular pressure, IOP, and that's why you may be taking your drops, hopefully, and I'll certainly after hearing me, you will certainly not skip a dose. Um, but is what you may not know, and I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the biology of pressure, uh, but then mainly what happens to the ganglion cells, which are the cells that die, that cause you to go blind in glaucoma. But IOP, increase in intraocular pressure, it used to be thought that it would affect um, the, the, can you all see my cursor moving a little bit over here? Okay. Um, the thought that it would render pressure here in the optic disc somehow, but now we know from work of many people that it's really the sclera, the white part of your eye, that it, it swells like a globe, and it's that force that is compressing somehow the, the, the cables here in the optic nerve head, and that is what blinds. And I'll come back to some mechanisms that people think that how does that happen. You know, I am a trained neurobiologist. I um, so I view it as, you know, study neurons and 
ganglion cell is a neuron that happens to be the one that dies in glaucoma, but it's actually very similar to, there's other neurodegenerative diseases, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and they all take out one particular class of neuron, and glaucoma happens to take out ganglion cells, uh, which is unfortunate because it's the only cell that carries information from the eye to the brain. So the rest of your eye can be fine, but if the cable that goes from the eye to your brain is lost, then you lose vision. First, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about pressure, and you may have actually learned some of about pressure on your own. Um, and it's made at the front of the eye. So this is, if you're going through, the, this is the cornea, the part, front part of your eye. And this is the lens over here, which we use to focus, unless you get old like me, and then you have to get these glasses to help you focus. Um, but so the, the humor, aqueous humor, the fluid in the eye is made by this structure here that's behind the iris that you can't see from the front. That's called the ciliary body and that makes fluid constantly and it drains constantly through the front of the eye through uh, mainly the structure called the trabecular meshwork. Uh, but there's this other pathway that is less well characterized that we still know is important. Uh, that's called the uveal scleral pathway. Um, but What's of relevance in terms of treatment of glaucoma is that everything that we can do so far for glaucoma involves dealing with the pressure. That is, we have some drugs. Most of the drugs deal with either promoting less fluid being made by the ciliary body or making it drain better. So far, the drugs haven't been selective for whether it goes out through this channel or it goes out this way. There's a new generation of drugs coming out that is just hitting you know, markets now that are more selective for just affecting the trabecular meshwork. And, and what I'm not gonna go into is there's actually a lot of excitement in people studying um, the, the plumbing of the eye. And I'm not one of those who gets excited about the plumbing of the eye, but those who study this are very excited because they just, in the last couple of years, appreciated that this Schlem's canal is incredibly important for the regulation of, of uh, pressure. And if I were to look into my crystal ball, I would say that five years from now, there will be drugs you know, that are targeting this, this Schlem canal rather than these structures here. So I think there will be new drugs coming out um, that are further helping the managing the pressure. Of course, you can't manage the pressure unless you take your drops. And then, you know, of course, there are also some surgeries that some of you may be familiar with that basically shunt the fluid so that it can leave the eye. And there's um, recently there's these, they're called MIGs, it's the shorthand, it's called minimally invasive glaucoma surgeries that are making it smaller stents and other, I've heard it described as in tickling the trabecular mesh works so that you can actually, the fluid drains better. And th those are actually, there's a lot of excitement, a lot of new development there. But for a lot of people who manage their pressure, they continue to lose their cells. Moreover, there are lots of people who lose cells due to glaucoma who do not have an increase in intraocular pressure. That's particularly the case in other countries, like in Asia, where the most prevalent forms of glaucoma do not have an increase in intraocular pressure. So I just wanna leave you with is that intraocular pressure right now is what we treat, but it doesn't help everybody. And we sure wish that there were other ways that we could treat, and there aren't. But we're, we scientists, many of us are working on so that that's no longer a true statement. That is that there will be other ways of treating glaucoma other than just treating the pressure. Uh, and I'm not gonna go into the detail of the trabecular meshwork here, but basically to say that it's a complicated structure and there's this kind of sieve or colander through which fluid has to uh, go out in the trabecular meshwork. And if there's too much stuff on the outside of cells or if the cells get sickly, then you end up getting the fluid has trouble draining, which is difficult to, fi to fix. Um, but if any has questions specifically about that, we can come back that to the end. Now, many of you may have heard about genes in glaucoma. Every disease out there has genes that are associated with the risk of getting the disease. And 
for glaucoma, like in some other diseases, most other diseases actually, there are these genes that are called big effect genes, meaning if you happen to have the bad version of this gene, you're very, very likely to get glaucoma. And we, you know, the most famous of those is called myocillin, and it has to do with those cells that I mentioned that get sickly and therefore the fluid doesn't flow. We, in my lab, study two other genes, um, and I'll show you some raw data on this later, but these are the ones that cause disease even though there isn't increasing in the ocular pressure. Okay, and I wanna make distinguish this from what many people have, especially you know, with uh, how easy it is to get one's um, um, DNA sequence now, there's from companies like 23andMe or whatnot, there's coming up with, you may have, you know, you get this little kit that you send in and you said, oh, you have this risk gene for glaucoma or this risk gene for diabetes. Those are all coming from what's called genome-wide association studies. Doesn't matter what the name is, but these is really small effects. Meaning if you have the bad version of this glaucoma gene, it Risk increases your risk diddly squat, right? It does statistically, if you look at a huge population, you see that it does have an effect, but from a practical perspective, it should not change your lifestyle. I, I shouldn't say that. You can't always do everything you can uh, for you know, your disease, but they're really, really tiny effects as opposed to these big effect genes like myocillin and, and this gene optinurin, um, but those are extremely rare. So if you, you know, for whatever reason think, you know, been told, you know, you have this particular bad gene for glaucoma, chances are no big deal. It doesn't really matter. Okay. Now, Anna and I both actually study ganglion cells, and those are our favorite cells, our favorite neurons. And these are the cells that die in glaucoma. And, but I, I just wanted to mention that it's really, even though it kills only ganglion, ganglion cells, the other cells in your eye are also affected in very important ways. So the, the retina, which is our, the lens in the back of your eye that allows us to see is absolutely amazing machine that allows us to pick up the minuscule amount of light and turn that into something that we can interpret. We can see our retina can detect movement, it can detect edges, and then you know, it can take all that information and send it to the brain, which is why you need the ganglion cells. But there are these other cells in the retina, they're called glia and microglia, that are kind of play more like these immune functions. And one thing that has emerged over the last five or more years is that these other cells are incredibly important for glaucoma. That is, they become, they know that there's a disease well before the clinician does. And they change in very meaningful ways. And there's these studies actually very recently that would say that what you do to one eye is known by the microglia in the other eye, which is actually something of relevance to glaucoma because it's, you know, as many of you may know that, you know, if you have glaucoma in one eye, you manage that and sometimes you get glaucoma in the other eye and that may not be a coincidence. And it's only that very recently in the last couple years that there are some inroads being made to understanding how it can be that disease can spread from one eye to the other eye. So that's a really active area of investigation that I find really exciting. So I'm gonna show you a couple pieces of data. Um, this is one quite old from my lab. I'm just keeping track of the time because I know Anna will pull the hook and, you know, the remote hook and drag me off of the screen um, if need be. So these are ganglion cells, the little white dots. This is a mouse eye that has Glaucoma. This is actually happens to be the, an, old, an inbred strain of mice. People like breeding their mice for their pets. And this particular inbred strain of mice gets glaucoma. And this um, model, which is we study these models because we can't do these studies in humans for obvious reasons. But you can see that there's loss of lots of these white dots, the ganglion cells. It still has lots of ganglion cells, and that actually is something that we see in the human disease, right? So you have parts of your vision that you've lost, but other parts of your retina are perfectly fine, and what you're hoping is that the disease doesn't spread to the parts that are normal. 
So we and others have been studying you know, what's going on with uh, ganglion cells, and we know that lots of things change. Basically, the bottom line is that ganglion cells get sickly before they die. And this is just shown, this happens to be a gene, but there's many other genes in ganglion cells, and this is just showing one that you can see that there's very little bit in this region that has very few cells. The few cells that are left, they have very little bit of this gene left. So they're very sickly, but they're still there. And that actually offers an opportunity for intervention that I'll, I'll talk about later. The other thing that you see is, this is in the mouse where we put a tracer into the brain and asked it to go back to the eye. That works perfectly fine in the parts of the retina that are still there, but in the parts that are sickly, the dye no longer gets back from the brain. So if the information doesn't go from the brain to the eye, chances are those ganglion cells are not taking any information to the brain either. So, so they lose their connectivity before they die. Once again, that opens a window of possibility for intervention. If they're still there and not quite right, maybe we can make them right. And that would restore some vision. Um, having said that, at some point, the ganglion cells die. And once they're gone, there's nothing to be done unless Anna can fix your retina, which I'm hoping she will. So, but we have to wait for that. Okay, so where do the ganglion cells get damaged? So ganglion cells, I showed you the, the cell that was in the eyeball. Turns out that the, that part of the ganglion cell is a minuscule part of the whole ganglion cell. The ganglion cell is mainly the cable that carries the information all the way to the brain. So there's more stuff to a ganglion cell in the axon than there is in the cell body. And we think that that actually is part of why it becomes susceptible. Keeping these really long cables is difficult. And in glaucoma in particular, we know precisely, I should say, this is actually to show that that cable gets insulated as soon as it leaves the eye. Um, and just so that the information flows faster to the brain. And that's a good thing, because if you had the insulation in your eye, you wouldn't be able to see clearly. But so it gets insulated right outside the eye and is precisely right there, just before the cells, the, the cables get insulated, that that's where the axons get damaged in glaucoma. So that is why people lose vision, is because their cables break, and we know precisely where they break is just as they're leaving the eye in what's called the optic nerve head, which is an area that we study very actively. So this is a cartoon, I showed you that before. And I just wanna highlight that there's all these other diseases and conditions that affect vision, um, but glaucoma is very specific insofar as the insult is right there as the axons are leaving the eye. And you may ask yourself, how does pressure up here in the front of the eye have anything to do with what's going on back here? And hopefully, um, I'll give you some information on that in a few minutes. But if you have multiple sclerosis, or you have, you know, there's trauma, particularly in, 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 in war scenarios, there's a lot of head trauma, and unfortunately, you know, most head trauma affects as vision impairment because it damages the axons. Um, so there, there's a lot of other reasons why vision is lost. Uh, but in glaucoma, the insult is precisely, we know where it is, it's right as the axons leave the eye. And this is the anatomy of when the axons are leaving the eye, what does it look like? So you and I, hopefully, you know, at least we started out with about a million ganglion cells. And with age, we lose some. If you have glaucoma, you'll lose more, obviously. You know, you have to lose a lot to lose vision. By some estimates, you have to lose half of them, depending on where it is. But that's a good thing, but it's also a bad thing because it's a bad thing because by the time you learn that you've lost vision, you have already lost many, many ganglion cells. And that means it's incredibly important to develop earlier diagnostics for glaucoma so that we can detect people before they've already lost all their cells. Because once they lost their cells, it's very difficult to get them back. And, you know, and we're hoping for stem cell approaches as Anna will talk about. But these axons don't leave the eye, one, one million different axons leaving the eye. 
They actually travel, they travel together as cables that have hundreds of axons. And we know that it's, glaucoma is a disease of cables. It's not a disease of individual axons. I won't go into the details of why we know that, but just the pattern of vision loss tell us that what's happening in glaucoma is these whole cables carrying lots and lots of axons somehow gets damaged. And it turns out that it's actually the ones starting right here that are closest to the edge as they leave. Those are the ones that are first damaged. And then the fact that you lost this bundle will affect the next bundle. And that's why the disease spreads. So we are interested in understanding why is it that this first bundle is most sensitive. And we're also interested in understanding what actually is most practical, in my opinion, is how does one prevent the spread from one cable to the next cable? Because by the time you get to the clinic, you've already lost some, and you just want to stop from losing others. Okay. Now, the optic nerve head, which is where you lose these axons, is a, it's a, for those of us who study it, it's, it's beautiful because it's so organized and, and um, it's, it's, it's lovely, right? It's not lovely if you lose your axons, then something went wrong. And, but we understand a lot now about what the optic nerve head is. And it's, we've been known for a long time that just as the axons leave the eye, they go through, and I made the analogy earlier of a colander. There's a colander in the back of your eye, which is called the lamina cribosa. And these cables squeeze through these holes that are in this colander. And that, that, this colander, which is made of this stuff on the outside of cells, is very stiff. And it, now we know from recent work that this is a structure that develops in response to pressure. It's your body trying to protect those axons from getting damaged. So when you're born, you don't have a lot of this lamina cribosa, and people now know that if you increase the amount of pressure, you end up getting more of this lamina cribosa. So you're trying to protect your axons, but yet it fails and sometimes, and the axons will be damaged. So this is what it looks like in a very severe case. Fortunately, more often, it's much less severe than this. But you can see, just appreciate, you know, there's this meshwork here, and you can see how excavated your, the, the disc is in an advanced, this is very advanced glaucoma. And this is, you know, as you may have known, the, the ophthalmologist will look in the back of your eye and they'll look at your disc. So your disc is, you know, this is kind of what they're trying to visualize, is what's happening as these axons are leaving. And if they see that your cup to disc ratio changes, it's because they're saying, uh-oh, this is happening. And so this is the, the biology underneath, you know, what the doctors are trying to measure, but we don't have yet good ways of visualizing this in a live person. Having said that, there's new instrumentation coming along all the time, and as I'll end later, and saying that you know we have some of the leaders in the world in terms of developing new instrumentation um, here in Davis. So there's a lot of excitement to come from getting better instrumentation so that we can detect the disease earlier. And this is a little bit a plug-in for my science and kind of why we've been studying this you know, so avidly is that we discovered very much by accident, and a lot of science discoveries, I'm just looking at my clock here so that I don't go over here. Um, and I'm at 20 minutes, so I better speed it up. Um, so this is axons. The white part are these axons that carry the information. And this is the eyeball here is to the left, the brain is to the right. And what we found quite by accident is that axons do something very strange only in the optic nerve head, where they put out these chunks of themselves which this is not known to be, you'll find this in no textbook yet. It will be in textbooks at some point, but um, it's not known, it's surprising this happens in normal animals, not only in the disease. So this is a, we do think that it's a stress response. These axons are kind of partially damaged. So they do this, they put out their organelles, their mitochondria, which are the little batteries that they have on the inside they package them up in these little sacks and they spit them out. It's very unelegant. 
And we find this only in the optic nerve head. And, but it doesn't necessarily cause disease because it happens in normal animals. So we're very interested to know whether this very unusual biology that happens only in the optic nerve head is of relevance to this disease of the optic nerve head, which is glaucoma. Um, so we're studying, this is just another view of that to show you that in fact, this is kind of catching one individual axons. This is a reconstruction of it, but this is showing what's on the inside of that axon. And you can see all those little red dots are the mitochondria, these little the batteries of the cell. And it's very strange and mysterious why an axon would be shedding chunks of mitochondria. Now, I'm not gonna go into the details of the science other than to say that we're studying human diseases, human causing, human disease causing mutations, trying to understand why they behave differently. And what I'm showing you here, if this is actually, it'll sound a little strange and I can take questions at the end, but we've taken the human gene and we made it red by a trick and we put that gene into a frog. And then we're now, because we can, image the nerve in a live animal. So we can actually see stuff moving individually inside axons. And when we do that in a normal, using the normal gene that is in you and I, it's all good. The axons look healthy. But if you put the gene from a person with glaucoma, this optinurin gene, which is very rare, suddenly those axons just totally fall apart. So we're trying to understand what is it about this gene that makes these axons fall apart? Because we think that if we understand this, we will understand, at least in those cases of the E50K optinurin mutation, which is a tiny subset, we'll understand why they go blind, and hopefully that'll tell us why everybody else goes blind too. Okay, I'm just gonna skip. I just actually, I can't, this is new data that's like a month old. Um, I showed Anna, Anna was in a lab meeting on last Friday. They saw it for the first time because I wanted the input. This is on the top is mitochondria moving in, for reasons that we don't understand, in blue is, is the protein or the, that causes Alzheimer's. And what we find, for reasons that we do not understand, that this Alzheimer-causing gene is moving with the mitochondria and it's leaving the axons together with mitochondria as well. So this is a really interesting area that has us very excited because it tells us that maybe we're going to, whatever we learn about glaucoma, will be relevant to Alzheimer's and vice versa. What we know about Alzheimer's may be relevant for glaucoma as well. So I'm gonna skip through the, 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 you know, the big picture. So at the, but at the top you have pressure in many cases, not all cases. It leads to very complex sets of changes in the optic nerve head. Ultimately, it's the axons down here that get damaged. And we think that that involves how those axons interact with their neighbors in the optic nerve head. And we, act, we personally think that there is this inflammatory component that is the mechanism by which the damage to one bundle of axons spreads to the next. And this is a very new area that a number of scientists, including myself, are very excited about because if we're right, it will mean that there may be some anti-inflammatory like drug that might be able to slow, if not halt, the disease progression. There's lots of ifs there, and it, we need a lot of more work in the bench that has to be re reproduced by other scientists before we would be willing to take something uh, to the clinic, of course. Um, and so you may be asking, so what's the next, and actually I'm gonna skip this and to give Anna time and we can, um, um, well, I just mentioned it as an intro to Anna, um, that, what you know is right now, this is all we have. We can manage the pressure. What's coming online in pressure management, there are a few things. There's some new surgical techniques. There's gonna be some new drugs coming along that are based on our understanding of how fluid drains in the front of the eye. And that will lead to new drugs. There's this idea of neuro enhancement, which I said, these cells are still there for some period. If only we could make them healthier, and there was actually a clinical trial just published and a bigger one that's coming along that is very, very exciting. I don't want to mention drugs or anything because I don't want any of you taking drugs before the, the, the clinical studies are out. Um, 
Then there's also the concept of we have to stop the death of the ganglion cells because once they're gone, they're gone, right? So if we can just slow or stop after the axon gets damaged, if we can just prevent it from dying and going away, then it will give us more time to try these neuroenhancement approaches. And finally, the future, you know, as you know, for most people with advanced glaucoma, if you've already lost your ganglion cells, you know, you're not gonna get it back. You know, you're gonna prevent the spread by pressure lowering, but you're not gonna get back what you've lost. So what is it gonna to take to get back your vision? And this is where Anna is gonna uh, lead the, the discussion. So Nick gave a beautiful presentation about what glaucoma is um, and what's causing it. And I want to tell you more about the future. What are we trying to do in the lab to try to not only prevent more cells from dying, but how can we restore vision? Can we improve uh, vision for people that have already lost uh, a lot of it? Can you move forward? Um, uh, maybe, maybe not. There we go. So uh, Nick gave a beautiful introduction, so I don't need to go over this, but this is how we see the retina all the time in the lab. Um, so the picture that says A has is a section, a cross section of the retina where you see this gorgeous arrangement and the red cells at the bottom are these retinal ganglion cells. Um, and so in B, what you can see is each dot, each one of these dots, and this is a picture of a real retina uh, from a mouse, each one of those dots is one cell, and you can see how all, every single one of these cells are sending the cables towards the center of the eye, this region that Nick explained that it's called the optic nerve head. And in that place, they all get together to form the nerve. They all bundle together, and that is this connection between the retina and the brain. Can you move forward? So in a very quick recap, and now you just move, when there's an insult, a problem like higher pressure, What's happening is that these neurons slowly degenerate. They start to get sick, and then you know one of these axons start to get sick, and then they slowly die. So can you just, they'll die off as you progress, exactly. And that, this loss of cells, it's really, that's the reason why you are losing vision. It's because you are losing these cells and this connection between the retina and the brain. So, can you move, uh, Nick? So, as Nick said, time is everything. So the first approach, if you could, would always be to protect what you have. And that should always be number one. That should always be um, the first in any disease. And so if we can catch the disease and we have better ways of diagnosis, what we should always aim for is to protect the cells that are still there. Maybe they're getting sick, but they're still there. At um, uh, other stages of the disease, when it's more advanced, the cells are still there, but not happy. We need to aim to just make them healthier, and that's called regeneration. What my lab work is about is the later stage, when the cells are gone. There's nothing left, and there's no endogenous way. There's no way for the eye to just replace them. So can we just replace them with donor cells? And so it sounds simple, you lost some cells, let's put it back in, but it's not. It is actually very challenging and it has a lot of complications. Can you move forward? Thank you, Nick. So this is what we do in the lab. Um, so why is this difficult? So first, we need a source of donor cells. We need to find cells somewhere. Um, forward, sorry. Um, inject them in the eye and we need, after this injection, we need them to survive. We need them to be able to make it to the right place in the retina and stay there for a very long time. We also need, can you move forward? Um, for them to start growing axons first towards the optic nerve head, towards the center of the eye, but then these axons, and Nick show a beautiful image of how long these axons are, they need to grow all the way to the right parts of the brain. And what is important is that the connections that they need to establish need to be very precise. They have to be exquisitely precise. They cannot just connect with anything or probably it would be worse um, than not doing anything. So the last part that we really need is to get, can you move one forward, is to get the right connections. For them to establish connections with the brain 
and only the right ones. So all these steps are not easy steps to solve. And so in the lab, we're trying to find ways to just one by one solve these steps. And hopefully, slowly, we're getting closer to a cure, not just a way to stop the progression, but just a way to reverse uh, the disease. So what are we doing? First, um, as I mentioned, we need to find a source of donor cells. Sorry, can you move? <laughs> exactly. Um, so probably you all heard um, to talk about embryonic stem cells. So what are really embryonic stem cells? So embryonic stem cells are the cells that make the embryos. So you, me, everybody, all organisms, that little uh, chick there or that little mouse there, anything, any organism comes from a single cell. And so that single cell divides in two to make four, four, eight, 16, etc. At these very, very early stages of development, these cells are what uh, they're called pluripotent. And what that means is that they have the potential to make a whole body. And a whole body means everything. So you have to hear a picture of a neuron, a blood vessel, or muscle. These little cells can make a whole organism, including a retina. So we have figured out, not me, uh, but scientists, have figured out ways to culture these very early cells, uh, the cells that make an early embryo, in a dish. And we'll learn a lot about their properties. But obviously, there's not embryos around that we can use to, to study. So in 2006, can you move forward, uh, Nick? Um, Nobel Prize uh, Yamanaka figured out how to take other cells, for example, skin cells, and manipulate these other cells so that they become very similar to those cells in a very early embryo. So we can reprogram cells to make them pluripotent. And that's this uh, name, induced pluripotent stem cells. Um, we have these technologies in the lab. We can take any cell uh, from an animal, from a patient. Uh, normally we use uh, skin cells. So imagine a little biopsy or even uh, some blood. We can culture the cells in a dish and then we can manipulate them using four factors, four genes, and they slowly convert and they become very, very similar in every possible measure that these very early cells in an embryo. And so what's beautiful about this is that the cells now that we can make in a dish from a patient have the potential to make uh, eye cells. And so not only we learn how to convert cells into these um, stem cells, we also learn how to culture them. And by years and years of study of developmental biology, we learn the blueprints of how an embryo gets made. What are the signs and the molecules and the molecular cues that are telling the cells slowly what they need to become. So an embryo, as it, they develop, you have a head and you have two arms and you have a liver and eyes. So we learn which molecules are making the embryo and we can replicate the same conditions in a dish. So we can direct these stem cells into becoming a retina. Can you move? And so this is what we do in the lab. They are not a full retina, but they do have many characteristics of the retina. So we call them mini retinas or retinal organoids. Maybe this is a word um, that you heard. And so these are tiny little balls of cells that slowly, as we keep changing the media in which we grow them, and we keep adding the right molecular cues and the right directions for them, they become first neuronal progenitors, the cells that will make neurons, and slowly they make this layered retina that has all the different neurons of a retina, including the retinal ganglion cells. Not only we can make them in the lab, we can also manipulate them. Can you move one more? And so for example, we can label them. Um, and this is an example in which we label them with this red protein. Um, and the reason why we do this is because this allows us to just follow from these little balls of cells that we make in the lab, which cells are the cells that uh, we are interested. How much of this little ball is indeed retina, or which ones of these cells are retinal ganglion cells. So we can follow the production of retinal ganglion cells in a dish. Um, one more. And so this is an example of one of these mini retinas in a dish. And in red, you can see the part of this uh, mini organ that's actually retina. And so we still need uh, to figure out 
um, as you can see in this, in this uh, picture, part of that is red, and that part that's red, it's layered, it has retinal ganglion cells, and these are the cells labeled in green and in blue, but part of that big organoid is not retinal. And so we still need to figure out how to make this process better. So everything that we make is actually retina. And can you move one more? Um, and so uh, with this, with this technology, there's many, many options of what we can do. We can use these retinas, these ganglion cells that we make in a dish for drug screening. So we can try to find uh, drugs that can protect the cells from dying. We can use them to uh, make them sickly, similar to the cells in glaucoma, and then try to see how that process is working. Or in my lab, we're interested in obtaining lots and lots of them uh, as donor cells for transplantation therapies to replace the cells that you lost uh, in glaucoma. Can you move uh, forward? But um, as I said, the process is not yet perfect. And so we have two main issues. The first one is that these cells are only a small proportion of the cells that we obtain in these mini retinas in a dish. So in this picture, you can see the ganglion cells, the cells that we are interested in are green, uh, but there's many more red cells than green actually, um, which we are happy because we can make them. But if you want to purify them from these uh, mini organs in, in the lab, and we need to have a pure population, this process is very expensive and labor intensive because we need to make many, 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 many of these organoids to have enough cells for a transplant. But the other problem, and it's a bigger one, is that these cells do not survive for very long time in culture. Um, as I said, we learn the conditions that make them, what happens during development so we can get to them. But you need to remember they're in a dish, they're not in an organ. These little retinas do not have vasculature they don't have blood supply, they don't have enough oxygen, they don't have, get enough food, and so we can keep them alive for so long. And so that gives us a lot of constraints in what we can do. So what are we doing in the lab uh, right now? First, we are testing a lot of the drugs that uh, scientists have found that are very efficient in protecting cells, in protecting ganglion cells in the eye, and we're trying to use them in these organoids, in these uh, little dishes in the lab, to try to see if that also protects them, the cells that we make from stem cells. And so we have an ongoing collaboration with this guy in the picture. His name is Dr. Derek Welsby. Um, he's at uh, UC San Diego, where we found some molecules that are very efficient in uh, protecting the cells that we make uh, from the stem cells. Can you move uh, forward? Uh, but not only we found ways to protect them, and to get more and more cells to survive, we also found ways to make these cables longer. And that is very important because as Nick showed, these axons, these cables need to grow very, very far. They need to go all the way from your eyes to your, to your brain. And so we need to find ways for these cells after transplant to grow axon all that way. And so we're starting to learn about the molecules that help uh, in these processes forward, sorry. And so finally, this is very new. I'm very excited about this, but it's extremely new. So this is not a technology that's yet uh, ready, but what we are doing is purifying the cells that we can make. And I keep telling you that it's not perfect yet, but we can make them. Um, we can get them to survive better now. So we are starting to purify them and try if upon a transplant, when we inject them in an eye, they can survive. And this is the very first step to get to a point where we can have a cure uh, for glaucoma, for the latest stages of glaucoma, when vision is very much affected. Um, but um, I want to really stress the fact that this is an ongoing uh, research. It's not ready, we are not there, and we need a lot of investigation before we get there. The reason why I'm saying this is because there's lots and lots of clinics um, that will take your money and will offer you stem cell therapy. Nothing that they claim has been proved by science, by real scientists, 
There's only a few stem cell treatments that have been proven safe and effective right now, but none of them for glaucoma, sadly. And um, I want to remind you that the only FDA approved and safe method for treating glaucoma right now is to treat the eye pressure. Can you move one? So any clinical study needs to follow a proper protocol to make sure it's real and it's safe. These clinics mostly exploit the most vulnerable patients. They go for the patients um, where that run out of possibilities. You've been told by your doctor that there's nothing else they can do for you. And then you think probably at that point, well, I have nothing to lose, but you actually have something to lose. Some of these unproven treatments can uh, create infections, inflammations, and it can make things much, much worse. So there's no treatment, stem cell treatment, available nowhere in the world yet. Um, so please don't fall for any of these clinics because they'll take your money. It's gonna cost you 30, 40, $100,000 and it's not gonna help and it may hurt. So I don't want to end here. So I have one last slide because that is hope, right? So I don't want to end in a note that, oh, there's nothing there. It's true, there's nothing there yet to restore vision, but we are working on it. And um, a lot of times I get the question and I'm happy to go there. Okay, when is this gonna happen? How long is it gonna take? Um, and the answer is, I don't know, because scientific research is not a straight line. We always have to go into multiple avenues before we find one that works. And it's a matter of trial and error and we fall and we fail and we need to you know, stand up again and try again. Um, but we are making progress. So the first time that we learn how to reprogram cells, skin cells into becoming stem cells was in 2006. It may seem a long time ago, but it's not. 2006, we learned for the first time ever how to create these cells in the lab. By 2015, we had the first clinical trial using these cells. And right now, this year, we have 53 clinical trials ongoing using stem cells, iPS cells. So we are making lots of progress. Um, and I want everybody to have hope. Um, but I also want everybody to be smart about uh, where you go. And so this is my uh, last slide that is hope, but I'm super happy to uh, take any questions. Sorry, Nick, for That's making true. you work for me. <laughs> Thank you, Anna and Nick. Does anyone have any questions so far? Yes, I have a question. Okay, go ahead, Bill. Uh, yes. Uh, I happen to be fortunate enough to not only have glaucoma, and it's not very serious, but I do have it. But uh, and I, it was diagnosed about seven or eight years ago. Uh, but about three years prior to that, I had uh, a uh, malady called central retinal vein occlusion in one eye. And I'm just wondering, as you're talking about the retinal uh, ganglion cells, uh, and the stem cell research. Is there much, if any, research done on how to repair a bumpy retina? Which is basically I, I, how I understand what I have is uh, it's not a smooth retina. So the picture that is sent to my brain is uh, uh, not a clear picture of what I'm seeing. Um. So there's a lot of stem cell research ongoing in every aspect of disease, I would say. Um, so I'm not a clinician, so I don't know enough um, about your diagnosis. And I would love if Jamie wants to step in, uh, Dr. Ran. Um, but there is stem cell research ongoing for every single retinal disease that you can think of. So there's lots of research ongoing for, for the receptor degeneration um, to help with the vasculature of the eye or even the trabecular meshwork, right? So Nick mentioned before that part of 
what we can do right now is uh, try to fix the drainage. So um, the answer is yes, uh, but I don't know more than yes, that is research on volume. If I can add just one couple comments. One is that you know, there are many scientists who do believe that there is a, a vascular component to all glaucomas. It's not a universally held belief, but I think many glaucoma scientists believe that at least a fraction of the glaucomas do involve a vascular component. I also should say that in that early diagram that I showed about insult being specifically at the optic nerve head for glaucoma, that's also true for some um, ischemic optic neuropathies that, not glaucoma, different disease, but in my opinion, um, they also are um, good candidates for the ultimate replacement of ganglion cells to, to restore vision. But I don't know if Dr. Brandt wanted to, to comment on this as well. Sure. Um, there we are. Um, first of all, from the standpoint of retinal vein occlusions, Dr. Park of our department has one of the only FDA, not approved, but sanctioned uh, uh, studies of the use of stem cells in the treatment of eyes with retinal vein occlusions. They're very strict criteria. They can't have other diseases like glaucoma because they're trying to track a variety of things. And the goal there is not to regrow the entire retina, but to regrow the blood vessels in the retina. And the retina is incredibly complex. And so somebody who has a, a retinal vein occlusion you may block the blood flow, but there are a whole cascade of other things that happen to other structures in the retina. Uh, so just fixing the blood vessels would be a great first step, but it's not a cure for the damage that would happen from a retinal vein occlusion. Um, so for Mr. Ponsetti, that, exp that perhaps explains some of your um, questions. Were there other things you wanted me to comment on, Nick? Oh, no, that's it. Thank you. I, I want to clarify something. I made my whole, I, I just get very adamant about these clinics, stem cell clinics. Uh, but I want to clarify that that's totally different than a clinical trial. So there's serious, rigorous clinical trials ongoing. We have some at the eye center. And that's a totally different story. If there's somebody who wants to take 50,000 of your dollars and they promise you a cure, well, they're lying to you right now. It's mm -hmm. different than a clinical trial. Somebody's doing research um, and it's serious and it has all the criteria and all the safety uh, protocols have been in place before we get there. Um, and so that those are very, very different. Um, I just wanted to clarify, yes. Well, I am absolutely in awe of the presentation that was made today. And I want to thank, thank Nick and Anna so very much. You brought it down to the kind of language that I could almost understand. And I'm sure many of the other people that attended today could understand exactly what your goals are. And your goals are what we are hoping for. And if not for us, for future generations, because that is what it's all about. You know, you may not be able to fix it today, but you're going to get to the point where you can fix it for somebody else in the future. And that's going to be the best gift you can give people who are living with glaucoma. Isn't that right, Dr. Brandt? Yes. <laughs> so I, and I thank you for joining us today also. It was nice to see you. Um, so I want to thank all of our members who attended today. Uh, Rebecca has told me that she has recorded this um, presentation, so hopefully I will get a link that I can then share with those of you that couldn't attend today for whatever reason. And hopefully that will uh, give you an opportunity to learn what the rest of us have learned today. Um, I'm just so grateful and so thankful. It's just wonderful. Good to see good to see the donations going to good work <laughs> absolutely and if anyone has any other further questions feel free to email me or just respond to that invitation i originally sent you or reach out to bonnie as well and she can always filter your questions to us and we can get to the right person okay thank you goodbye everybody bye, bye everyone, everyone.